So it's, a, it's really a pleasure being here. Um, the first time I was in this room was uh, 1982. <laughs> At the time, um, I had two big fears in life. One of them was that the um, man standing here would find out that I didn't know what the role against perpetuities was. <laughs> <laughs> and the other was that the student sitting on the other side of me would figure out that I was gay. Um, some things have changed. <laughs> At the time, but but I still don't know what the room is. <laughs> um, at the time, a uh, matter of Fibosa, which was the watershed US, U.S. case recognizing uh, sexual orientation as a ground of relief uh, under under the Refugee Act, uh, had still not been published. Had, I, I'm not even sure if it had been decided yet. <clears throat> Hadn't been decided or, or published. Uh, people weren't talking at all about LGBT refugees. Uh, there were some. There were some people who were coming out of the woodwork here, and there were very, very few, few. And none of us really understood that there was a worldwide phenomenon mm -hmm. of people who were escaping persecution based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. It was something that we took for granted. Uh, we we just assumed that in places all over the world, you had to be afraid because you were You know, we talked about it. Certainly, no one connected the dots. Um, I certainly didn't connect the dots that we were talking about an enormous, an enormous invisible worldwide phenomenon of hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are running for their lives. Uh, we, don't, we don't know about most of them. <coughs> Probably never will. Okay, um, we're in uh, San Francisco, so one of the things that is not hidden is uh, what a lesbian, a gay man, or a bisexual, or a transgender person is. Um, so um, I will skip these, these definitions. Uh, the last category, that uh, we wanted to talk to you about today, which is still hidden, is the category of uh, intersex refugees and asylum seekers, and Anne Mattis here will, will talk much more about it, so I don't want to take your time. But we're basically here to talk to you about lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, um, both male to female, female to male, and intersex refugees. <coughs> the um, uh, UNHCR, the UN High Commission for Refugees, has uh, taken a a uh, very innovative and positive approach uh, to, toward this subject, requiring less that we put people into boxes when we define sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, define sexual orientation as a person's capacity for profound emotional, affectional, and sexual attraction to and intimate, um, intimate and sexual relations with um, individuals of the same gender or both genders. Uh, and gender identity refers to someone's deeply felt individual um, experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. Uh, so these defin why, why these definitions are very important is that they allow the maximum space for the asylum seekers or the refugees to self-define and coming forward, uh, as much space as is allowed by a refugee convention and really the U.S. Refugee Act, which um, like a lot of other aspects of our law, requires that people place themselves in boxes and categorize themselves. Uh, what are the kinds of persecution that people are escaping worldwide from our experience? Judicial and extrajudicial uh, execution. That means uh, if, you're, if you're in one of the countries that actually executes LGBTs, and there are, there are several of them, um, you could become a refugee. Uh, or if you're running away from non-state actors, from private individuals who want to leave. Um, honor killing is very common in certain parts of the world, where a family will essentially eliminate one of its members who is causing its shame or is making it impossible for another family member to marry or to exist or to, to seek financial <coughs> Torture and wrongful imprisonment extremely common, corrective rape and punitive rape. You've probably been hearing about this phenomenon, which is uh, especially common in South Africa today uh, for lesbians. It's a phenomenon where, um, in the case of a woman, a, a man will rape her to teach her how to be a woman. Uh, in the case of a man, if the man is being raped, uh, another man will punish him for being homosexual by raping him. In that case, it's only the, uh, the person being raped who's a homosexual. The person raping is, is not homosexual. Um, that's the moral accurate. Um, 
sustained violence and harassment, uh, withholding of protection by authorities. Uh, this is probably one of the most common, one of the most common phenomena. Um, and you find that people are either afraid to approach the authorities uh, because they're afraid the authorities themselves will persecute them, or will, or the authorities themselves will laugh at them and deny them protection altogether. And it's probably the most common experience by LGBTs worldwide, I would say. <coughs> Deprivation of employment, medical abuses, and that includes um, medical uh, abuses by medical professionals, whether the psychiatric profession uh, professionals or um, in um, a country like Iran, where the medical profession actually encourages, strongly encourages individuals who, would, who are gay or lesbian to have sex reassignment in order so that they become heterosexual. Everyone follow that? <coughs> um, pervasive forced homelessness. Uh, many of our clients uh, can't find homes, can't find safe homes. Um, forced marriage, very common. Uh, especially for lesbians, but also in, in the case of gay men, uh, and violence of based bars to education. Um, most, even here in the United States, uh, a recent study indicated that uh, the average gay child hears a slur 23 times a day going to school. Uh, many of our clients who grow up in countries that are less advanced in the United States report that they're regularly, regularly bullied, beaten up, uh, some are sexually abused at school, um, they can't get protection from their teachers, um, and as a result, many of them stop going to school. They, they drop out of school. That, of course, has very long-term consequences for the client, for the refugee, um, and probably the main, the main two consequences are psychological. Um, you, you can't ever forget those kinds of experiences, and just, they just form an indelible part of who you are, but uh, also as a practical matter, not having education and not having the power of the word or the power of the person that comes with the power of the word in many cases, especially when you don't have family backing you, means that you can't have a successful refugee experience. And what I mean by that is that you can't successfully pick up from your home country and weather all of the elements, including the financial human elements, the abuse all around you, cross national borders and get to a place of safety. Uh, in order to do that, the better educated you are, the more money you have, the more likely it is that you're going to make it. And of course, the more likely it is that you're going to make it when you finally resettle in a place, in your final place of, of uh, refuge, if you reach there. Which um, most LGBT refugees don't, by the way. Okay, so who are we talking about? And what is this worldwide phenomenon? 5% of the human population lives in countries that impose the death penalty for same-sex acts, 5% of the human population. <clears throat> Another 16% of the human population lives under laws that criminalize same-sex acts. These are consensual same-sex acts that we're talking about. The gray area on this chart that you see is, uh, we, we just kind of uh, pulled this number out of a lot of estimates. We estimate that an additional 29% live in countries where there are serious human rights abuses uh, against LGBTs, human rights abuses of, of all kinds, many of the kinds that I was describing before, uh, most of them by non-state actors, by private individuals. So, how, wide, how big is this phenomenon? About half of the world's population lives in a place where they need to be fearful because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, half of the world's population. This is, this is scary stuff. Uh, and if I were an, um, a policymaker uh, trying to figure out how to, how to uh, <coughs> cobble together laws that protect LGBTs uh, in one jurisdiction or another, I'd be saying, oh my god, these, this is floodgates. We're talking about huge masses of numbers who could eventually come here and uh, demand to be protected. What do I do about that? It's, it's, it's a good question. Right? It's good not being government, because then I don't have to answer those questions. <coughs> um, but it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me, it's interesting to me that having worked in the field for, uh, for so many years, I never realized the, the breadth and the depth of this issue, uh, and, and just how pervasive it is in areas around the world, uh, and you'll be able to see that in this map here. Um, the map that you see is, um, has red areas, the red countries that you see are the countries that apply the death penalty for a same sex. 
the countries that you see in black are the countries that criminalize same-sex acts in one way or another. And the countries that you see in gray are the countries where, um, uh, where we talked about before, the 29% of the world's population that lives under other human rights abuses that are related to their being LGBT. <coughs> so, I think pretty easily uh, what we're talking about, the areas that are particularly uh, rich in persecution uh, range from uh, the cover of the MENA region especially, but also large areas of Africa. Uh, and that's why it's not surprising that worldwide a large percentage of the LGBT asylum seekers are from those regions, that MENA being uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and um, and uh, in Africa, as you can see, uh, many of the countries are severe abuses. In the United States, the pattern is a little bit different, and Emilio will talk about that uh, in a bit. It's because of, of our geographical proximity and the enterability of the United States to, uh, to LGBTs from Latin America. We're seeking asylum here. What else can this map show you? Well, there's, there's a very unusual phenomenon that exists among LGBT refugees um, and asylum seekers that really isn't found among many other populations. In most world populations, you will find a large number of people becoming refugees. In other words, leaving their country of origin, going to a passage country, um, and living there in camps or in an urban setting for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. Um, and that's what we, that is the bulk of the world's refugee population of about 10 million today. The world's population of asylum seekers, that is people who have gone directly to a country where they can seek protection, is much smaller worldwide. Um, in the LGBT context, that is absolutely reversed. And the, the vast majority of refugees that we see who are LGBT are, in fact, asylum seekers. So they're people who manage to find their way into a country like the US, the UK, um, Australia, Canada, and ask for asylum there. Um, and this map shows you exactly why that is. You can start to connect the dots. Um, if you are from Egypt, okay, let's. Take a look at look at the map. Everybody know where Egypt is? It's on the tip of Africa, on the uh, on the northeast tip of Africa, and you are being uh, you are being sought out by your brother for an honor killing because you you've been found out to be uh, to be lesbian. Where can you go? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go south to Sudan, where you'll get the death penalty? Are you going to go west to Libya? Are you going to go into the Sinai, where you'll probably be raped and killed before you, uh, you make it across another border? Um, <coughs> you have nowhere to go. So what you're going to do is you're going to stay in your home country. If you're lucky and if you're able, you're going to stay in hiding. You're going to stay in the closet. You're going to be terrified. You're going to stay in the closet. Um, and you will wait for the day when you can make your escape. And you'll apply for a visa. Um, to either usually go to the UK or to the US or to another country, and that's going to be when you're going to come out. Uh, you know that you're not going to be able to survive in the country of passage, and so you're not going to take that risk. How do we know this is true? Uh, we, work, uh, we work largely with Iranians. Uh, Turkey is our largest on the ground project right now. Iran is a country of 70 million people today. If you do your math um, and you take your conventional wisdom, you will figure out that, let's say, 3.5 million Iranians are LGBT. Iranians, Iran is a country, is a very young country. It's a country with, with a lot of single males. They're not all gay, uh, but <laughs> many are, and they live under the threat of the death penalty. 4,000 Iranians have been executed since the revolution for, uh, for same-sex relations. So it's not, a, it's not a joke being LGBT in Iran. Women are also subject to very severe penalties, including 100 lashes. Um, um, so in Iran is one of the countries very, very clear that it's darn dangerous. Um, and we find that in Turkey, which is the country where the vast majority of Iranians pass through if they need to pass over land and they can't get into one of the Western countries, the client load is under 100, 100 out of three and a half million. And if you speak to our clients in Turkey and you ask them about their, uh, what they were thinking before they left or why their friends didn't leave, they'll all tell you the same thing. We know that things are horrible in Turkey. We're afraid to live in Turkey. 
Uh, we're afraid we won't get, be, able, be able to get past Turkey. We're afraid of being beaten up in Turkey. And that's indeed, that's exactly what happens. That half of our clients in Turkey report having been beaten up many times by other refugee populations, usually by their own refugee populations. Uh, they have severe survivability problems. Um, LGBT refugees usually don't have family support to fall back on. So that means that if you pick up and you cross the border from Iran to Turkey, and it's very easy to do that, or from Syria or one of the other countries that you can get into Turkey from uh, relatively easily, you're on your own. And you're on your own for a year, or two years, or three years, uh, and surviving is not easy. Um, let's go back to the numbers uh, for the overview. Uh, so I've given you here the, the populations of the countries that criminalize same-sex relations. And uh, the countries in, in red, we don't need to go into detail, uh, countries that uh, appear for you in red, otherwise where the death penalty uh, is applied. You've got Mauritania, Nigeria in the 12 northern provinces, Somalia, Sudan, Saudi Arabia with a population of nearly 30 million, Yemen, uh, and Iran, uh, I think uh, with 75 million. Sorry, I was close off by 5 million. Um, so you see this sort of massive, so altogether we have 568 million people living in uh, countries which, um, which criminalize same-sex relations or in one way or another. Did I get that right? No, I was wrong. The number is uh, going to be closer to 1.5 billion who live under those conditions. Uh, the, the math here is wrong. Uh, it's, a mass, it's a massive number of people. Um, take a look at these bar charts. Um, it's, we, do we know how many people in the world are LGBT? I, I think we don't. Uh, <coughs> the estimates range from 1%. Uh, some uh, studies in Western countries have shown that the numbers are higher than 10%. Uh, but for purposes of this exercise, I've assumed that a minimum, a minimum of 1% of the world's population is LGBT. Fairly small, <coughs> fairly small, very conservative estimate. And in this, in this little chart, uh, what we try to do is examine why so few LGBTs are coming out at the other end of the world of the international refugee system. Why there are so many LGBTs who end up surviving, coming through uh, the UN Mexican Ref Refugee System, the National Asylum System, coming out the, at the other end. Um, so let's run through the numbers. If we assume that there are 700,000 LGBTs who are self-defined or conscious of their own sexual orientation or gender identity, right? That's 1% of the total world population who are LGBT, according to statistics. Uh, if we assume 700,000 are self-defined or conscious in some way or another, um, and we assume that only 10% of those are self-announced or denounced by others, we end up with 70,000 um, 70, people. Out of those, many of those that we're living in the countries that are described to you, where you can be arrested, killed, beaten up, uh, we assume that 50,000 uh, will eventually be um, targeted. We'll assume that another 15,000 are physically and financially able to flee. As I was describing before, most cannot afford to flee, um, either, either because they are so traumatized psychologically, psychiatrically, um, a traumatized educationally, traumatized financially, that they just don't, that it's beyond their, their um, imagination that they can flee to another country. Um, we'll assume that out of those 10% are aware that refugee protection is available to LGBTs at all, and let me tell you that that's, that's an exaggeration. Most LGBTs around the world don't have any idea that they're entitled to refugee protection. Um, we'll assume that out of those 1,000 are able to access international protection, and we're talking about countries of transit now, um, and then let's assume that about half of those are legally recognized as refugees. That leaves 500 people worldwide. Um, and then let's assume very generously that out of those, 200 get settled somewhere. And that's actually also very, very generous. Um, and this is how you get to an end result where a U.S. system which, which resettled uh, over 60,000 people last year, resettled fewer than 200 openly LGBT people. 
They just cannot get through the system. By the time the system wears you down and beats you down enough, you get to a place where there's almost no one left. And this is the reason where if you know you're LGBT, what you're going to do is you're going to save your pennies. Now, you probably don't have a visa, and that means you can't very well go to a Australian consulate or a U.S. consulate and explain to the consul why it is that you're going to go back home after you're done visiting that country. If you don't have an education and you're not married and you don't have children and you don't have property, you can't get a visa in the first place to get into one of those countries, so you just never can get in there. Um, you will either travel clandestinely without documentation and coming overland, and again, that's a large part of the phenomenon that we see here in the United States, um, or you just um, won't go at all. And the vast majority of LGBTs will just stay home uh, where they'll live lives of desperation or die in desperation. And that's the reality that we're dealing with. Carol, can you keep track of time for me, please? You have time, keep it right in the front. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, what is a refugee? Don't want to assume that everybody knows. Um, it's um, someone who is outside their country of origin, who has a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, this is based on the 1961 Refugee Convention, which has been imported into U.S. law. Um, sexual orientation is, uh, uh, and gender identity are not enumerated per se in the Refugee in the 1961 Geneva Convention or in U.S. law, but it's now uh, fairly well accepted internationally that these categories constitute uh, membership of a social group, of a particular social group. This is not without its problems. And you'll be hearing about the problems that come, come from uh, these human-made definitions to a non-human-made phenomenon called sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, a particular social group means a group of people who share the same characteristic, which distinguishes them from society at large. Share some characteristic, which distinguishes them from uh, society at large. The characteristic has to be unchangeable either because it's innate or otherwise impossible to change because it would be wrong to require an individual to change that. Now, these, are, these are pretty tough words. What's innate? How many people in this room have seen proof that sexual orientation is innate? I've seen a lot of evidence, but I've never seen any conclusive evidence. If you, if you know of it, please speak up. Um, here in this room, sitting in San Francisco, I think most of you would probably agree that one's sexual orientation or gender identity is so fundamental to your character that it would be wrong to require you to change it. That's here in San Francisco. That may not be true in some other places, even in California, and it is definitely not true in many, many countries around the world. So we're dealing, again, we're dealing with legal definitions that are informed by cultural definitions and by cultural norms. Um, um, and although the convention would call for an international standard that would be applied the same everywhere, that's in fact not the case. So we're dealing with these, uh, these cultural understandings, both on the part of adjudicators, on the part of lawmakers, and on the part of the refugees themselves. And we'll get to that a little bit. Um, in terms of how uh, the LGBTs fit into the social group category, which is the vast majority of the claims, uh, lesbians, of course, share the immutable characteristic of being sexually or emotionally attracted to women, gay men, the same uh, for men. Uh, these characteristics, at least here in the United States, are regarded as fundamental um, and um, largely immutable. Bisexuals, more of a problem. Is bisexuality immutable? You tell me. Um, can is someone the fact of someone's being bisexual is probably not immutable, but bisexuals oftentimes spend periods being attracted to one sex or another, um, and are and oftentimes find it very easy to hide behind their bisexuality uh, so that they're not defined as a member of, of the um, the persecuted social group of gays or lesbians. Uh, there have been, the case law has been all over the place about bisexuals, about whether they, they are qualified as refugees. Uh, transgender, uh, probably the easiest kind of case to 
prove um, because transgenders are so uh, are so marginalized in society and so excluded and uh, picked upon and traumatized. But uh, I have to tell you that we haven't even won all of our transgender cases. There have been uh, several transgender cases that have been denied, uh, sometimes because the, uh, adjudicators outside the U.S. haven't understood what transgender is or haven't believed the client or uh, a related reason. Criminalization, another very, very tough issue. Um, one of the tenets of, uh, of uh, refugee law is that prosecution does not constitute persecution. So it's, it is a sovereign nation's right to pass laws that, uh, that allow for and prohibit certain behaviors. What do you do in a situation where a large percentage of the world's population lives under laws that prohibit its existence or, uh, or its acting according to, to, to uh, its internal feelings? Um, this is a very tough issue that has still not been solved. Uh, I think we can look for uh, to, uh, to Amelia and to Roy to, to perhaps help, help us understand the issue of criminalization better. Uh, but it's uh, generally accepted that the more, the more severe the criminalization is, the more severe the punishment is uh, for the same sex and for, for being uh, LGBT, the more likely it is that the person will qualify as a refugee. Oops, we've got, a, we've got another phenomenon. We've got a faith phenomenon. Um, um, another issue that's very, uh, that's very critical in LGBT claims, as it is in gender-based claims, uh, by the way, uh, is that the actors of persecution are almost always non-state actors. There are, there, there are, despite the large number of countries that criminalize same-sex acts, there are relatively few cases that are actually based on state persecution. The, the largest amount of persecution comes from non-state actors around the world. Uh, I don't have, I'm, I'm really BSing you someone because I don't have any stats. I don't think anyone has any stats, but uh, these are the cases that, uh, that I've seen in this 20 years. Most of the time we're talking about family, uh, about neighbors, about community members, about religious sanctions. Uh, about doctors, as we, talk, we were talking about before, about uh, paramilitary groups, and sometimes about state actors that, uh, that persecute LGBTs. Uh, the reason that it becomes so pernicious um, is that the non-state actors are not stopped from persecuting by the state actors. In other words, you as, you as a persecutor, if you want to beat up somebody who is LGBT, know that you're going to do that with impunity. And you can do it again and again and again. Uh, you, as somebody who's LGBT, uh, who are beaten up in a country where the, where the police uh, violate LGBTs, will never go to the police for protection. So it comes from both, uh, both sides. Um, in the LGBT phenomenon, we need to use a bifurcated analysis um, when we're looking at the claims very often. So what we, um, and that means that it's not that the state doesn't protect the individual, it's that the state won't, um, it's not that the state's persecuting the individual, it's that the state won't, um, won't go ahead and protect the individual. So it's those two issues together that, um, that give rise to refugee status if the case is approved. Discrimination is, up, is another issue, and, uh, and it's not just an issue in those UK cases. It's discrimination and whether discrimination constitutes persecution rises to the level of persecution uh, is common in every case. Uh, in LGBT cases, uh, discrimination is uh, very often consistent throughout a person's life. It uh, very often applies to every area of life, so it applies to housing, to employment, to medical care, to family relations, and so on. Um, and in those cases, you need to look at the totality of the circumstances and see, does this, what kind of life is this person living, really? Does this constitute an unlivable life? Is, it, is, is the kind of mistreatment that we're talking about so severe that it constitutes a deprivation of life, life of freedom? Um, and many times it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, another issue that's, that's very touch and go in LGBT cases is the internal flight alternative. Uh, internal flight alternative 
it is an obligation under a refugee law to go somewhere within your own country where you can be safe before you cross an international border and ask another country to give you protection. Everyone understand? So that means move to San Francisco or New York before requesting a refugee status in Des Moines. Um, um, this, uh, the internal flight alternative, when uh, we're talking about a government actor, or about a government prosecutor, um, is usually not present because the government governs the, rules the entire country. Uh, when it's a non-state actor, it becomes a much, much trickier issue. So if you're from a farm, if you're from the countryside, and your family wants to kill you, and you move to Cairo, uh, where there's a modicum of acceptance of LGBTs, at least in the underground, um, are you considered to be a refugee if you go to England and you request refugee status? <coughs> we need to look at case on the case by case on, on the facts that, um, that you've been presented with and see whether really the person could live in Cairo. Um, the issue that then appends uh, in these kinds of cases is very often, um, but thankfully not in the United States, is could the person go live in Cairo and live discreetly, live in hiding? And up until very recently, uh, the United Kingdom applied the requirement of what's called the discretion to LGBT cases, which required that you uh, go live, that you prove that you, you can't go live discreetly somewhere else. In other words, hide your sexual orientation or gender identity in order to survive. The, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom found last year, uh, last summer, that this reasoning was upside down, that it was illogical, that it was really basically giving in to the persecution that people are running away from uh, and it overruled, it overruled the discretion requirements that now the UK case can't be denied based on the fact that someone could go home and hide. Discretion still comes in in many other areas of the law, though in many other jurisdictions. Sometimes it's not called discretion. Um, sometimes it feeds in the United States into surplus claims. Uh, which is someone who did not come out of the closet back home, but comes out here in the United States. Again, because they were, maybe because they were too afraid to come out at home, maybe because uh, they were too ashamed to come out at home, uh, maybe because it wasn't time for them to come out at home. Um, and um, then the question uh, comes out, is the person qualified for refugee status? Do they have a well-founded fear? If they go back, will they be persecuted for their sexual orientation or gender identity? Will they come out? What's the likelihood? They would come out. It's a very complicated uh, decision-making process, and it's not simple. Credibility in LGBT cases. We've seen, especially in the UK, that after the demise of discretion, most cases that are being denied are being denied based on lack of credibility. Um, the applicant's not being believable that he or she is LGBT, or that what they say happened really happened to them. Um, how do you how do you find out if somebody is credible? What do you what do you require? How many people think that you should be able to require documentation that someone is LGBT? Okay, we have no way. <laughs> well, there, you know, we can't. Um, we can't we can't require documentation in any case. Uh, in the United States, the real idea makes that more complicated. Um, but um, there is no documentation today that I know of that someone is is definitely LGBT. What you need to do is interview the person, and it requires extraordinary skills on the part of the interviewer. Um, and as advocates, I think we often, you know, sitting on the side of, you know, of complainers and, and, uh, and lawyers forget how hard it is to sit across from somebody who's desperate for their life for any one of 50 or 100 reasons, and to be given an hour and a half to find out if what they're telling you is true. Uh, and afterwards, you two are a human being, and you need to live with the consequences of having made a mistake one way or another. Um, how many of you can tell with absolute perfection whether somebody is LGBT or T? Kara. <laughs> 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 <Era. laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, it's puzzling to everybody. It's problematic for everybody, and I think it behooves us as um, as advocates to always remember that that we're dealing with human beings who are really trying very often trying their best to decide a case um, in the way that's humane and that comes out comes at the truth. Uh, within the LGBT community it also behooves us and this is this is this is a neo lecture here, um, to be on the side of adjudicators finding out 
who is telling the truth and who is not, because there's a real, there's a real um, price at stake here. And that is, if adjudicators fall under the presumption that people can fake their sexual orientation or gender identity, but there's no way to tell, um, and that increasingly people will apply for refugee status based on being LGBT with impunity, that they won't, the cases won't be denied, then the bona fide cases won't be granted either. Um, and from this comes our motivation to work with adjudicators to train and to help them as, be as best as possible to, to uh, find the true cases, find the true cases of people are persecuted. Yes? I'm just wondering, if, so is it, is it necessary to show that you are in fact LGBTI or just that the persecution is based on a belief that you are? So that, you know, if you have the evidence, this is why you're being persecuted, but you have a client who hasn't really grappled to it to be able to use the language that we would need to use in American context, you know. Um, you would still have a claim, right? Or... In, um, you're raising a really, really fascinating issue. Um, and, um, and I think I'm not the best person to speak to it. Um, but uh, imputed sexual orientation or gender identity definitely is a grounds for relief. So if people are persecuting you because they think you are, you may well be eligible for relief, for refugee uh, act relief. But in fact, the vast majority of, uh, of people who are, but haven't come to terms with who they are, won't come out uh, and they won't be able to present their claims. Uh, and it's actually, I've uh, spoken to, to adjudicators at UNHCR. Um, there's one I remember in particular who told me, Neil, I've got this, got this applicant who is just gay as a goose. <laughs> but, he claims, but he claims that he's running away from, um, from political persecution. And I know that's not true. The claim is not consistent. It, it doesn't hold together. Um, I'd like to be able to give him relief, but I can't because he's not coming out and claiming. Uh, that he's gay, uh, and under that circumstance, I mean, there, you know, I, of course, I'd like to, I wanted to argue that yes, you should find a way and you know, do everything possible to help him come out. But you know, she had three interviews that same morning besides him, and two interviews in the afternoon after him, and didn't have time to play his psychotherapist to help him come out. Uh, so she ended up denying the case, um, and that's that is what happens most of the time because the vast majority of those people don't come out at the interview. And if we have a minute, we'll go into that. Uh, key problems of uh, credibility uh, are lack of knowledge about sexual orientation and gender identity. So a lot of uh, so adjudicators very often, much less here in the United States, the asylum office is really good um, in, in adjudicating this when the U.S. asylum office and the Canadian asylum office, by the way. Um, adjudicators don't know how to identify who is and isn't of um, In Turkey, we've had in the past uh, many cases denied because the applicant wasn't wearing makeup, wasn't wearing, if a gay applicant wasn't wearing women's clothing, could possibly be gay. It's because the adjudicators have entertained stereotypes about what LGBT is, and training is absent in those contexts. So we just don't know. Um, again, it's very easy to attribute pernicious motivations there. The fact is that what's really going on is that there are cultural prejudices that are coupled with lack of training. Uh, they're leading people to apply their, their everyday values to the refugees that they see. Uh, and if someone uh, is used to living in a country where being out is completely impossible, because the, the price is very high of being out, and the vast majority of, let's say, gay people are in the closet, and the only people that they see who are gay uh, wear makeup, then they assume that in order to be gay, you have to be wearing makeup. And you've got to train them otherwise, otherwise they're not going to know. Um, lack of knowledge about LGBT specific conditions in the countries of origin is another uh, reason where mostly outside of the U.S. claims get denied. Um, we've seen claims denied because uh, the applicant didn't know who Oscar Wilde was. The Afghan applicant doesn't know who Oscar Wilde was. Um, and every homosexual knows who Oscar Wilde is. Um, Self-denial, as I said, is the most, most common common enemy of the LGBT applicant, and I believe that still goes on, here, even here in the U.S., the vast majority of people will not come to a perfect stranger and admit to them that they are LGBT. Um, the vast majority of applicants are grappling and struggling every day to come out with their own 
homosexuality vis-a-vis their own families, vis-a-vis themselves, and the belief of, of their own values as a human being, they're certainly not going to go to a government official um, whom they perceive very often as threatening and tell them this terrible thing about themselves. So uh, the vast majority don't come out. Uh, another issue that we found that's, um, that's extremely challenging is dissociation, very common in uh, many of our clients who, especially the ones who've suffered sexual abuse as children, and that's very common in LGBT cases in some areas of the world, uh, where the applicant enters the room um, and becomes threatened. Um, in a threatening environment, someone who's been subject to childhood sexual abuse usually checks out uh, and is not able to hear the questions and is not able to answer the questions directly. And we've seen many cases uh, denied um, several times, and had to be appealed several times on the, until we finally were able to get through them. Because the applicants themselves were in the system. Uh, and we ourselves would have denied the case in the, in the same sort of situation. <coughs> Moving. Oh, there's one issue here that, uh, that we touched on before that I think is very important, and the issue is self-defining. In the United States, we know gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. There are flags in the street. You can tell who you are right away by looking, by looking up on Market Street. <clears throat> and you can self-define with relative impunity in certain places in the United States. But in most of the countries in the world, that is not the case. Um, and there's a certain, uh, I would say, arrogance on the part of us Westerners to assume that everyone else in the world can do that uh, if only they had the right knowledge. Uh, that everyone would be happy to self to self identify as LGBT, LGB or T, uh, just as they could. That's not the case at all. Uh, in many countries in the world, people look for millennia not self identifying as LGBT, and they're going to continue to not self identify. Um, and um, the problem is that that the Refugee Act and the Convention require you to self-identify in order to get relief. So how do you bridge that? I was going to talk about country of origin information, but I think I'm out of time. And I think Brian's going to talk all about it. Uh, so I'll just leave you with a few, uh, with a few final thoughts uh, about uh, what's happening to LGBT refugees uh, today. Uh, we're finding that the few of our clients who have actually managed to come to the United States are resettling in poverty. Uh, we're finding that a lot of the ones who come and requested um, asylum are also living in poverty, living in isolation, living out of contact with their community, um, out of contact with their community of origin, with their religious community, um, and also, sadly, not supported by the LGBT community very often. Uh, and one of the easiest things to fix is actually, uh, we believe, to get the community here to understand the issues and to support the ones who are able to escape persecution and to end up here in the United States, uh, especially here in San Francisco. Uh, so, um, well, there's a lot you can do on that front if you're here in this room. Um, and you can support refugees who come in. Uh, you can give up to the key refugees housing. Uh, we have a client who's arrived in 17 days and doesn't have a place to live. Um, you can uh, support the refugees by uh, giving them a job or by talking to your friends who have jobs, who might have a job available. Any low-paid job is good. Um, and most of all, by giving people a sense of the refugees a sense of community and a sense of support in the sense that there's a reason to keep living after what they've gone through.